right, good morning, everyone. Good to be with you all today. My name is uh, Tiffany. My husband, Elliot, and I have the great honor and privilege to be able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church, and I love being here every Sunday. So whoop, whoop. I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, we're in a series on the book of Romans, and every time that video plays, I really feel like I'm about to go into, like, battle or something. You feel like you're at the movies, and you're getting all set up, you need your popcorn. It's a Maybe I'm the only one who feels that way, like, yes, you know, <laughs> what are we going to see? Ah, it like stirs up action, the action part of me. Uh, well, okay, so we're in a series on the book of Romans, and I'm actually, I get the, the great joy of being able to conclude this series, so we're going to look at the, the last part of Romans today, uh, but we're looking at the book of Romans because we think that there is no better book than the book of Romans in the Bible that shows us how to live a complete Christian life. And if you're in church today or you're dancing around the subject of church or you're dancing around the subject of Jesus, uh, then you probably want to know how to live a complete Christian life. A complete Christian life, not being just knowing all the rules and what to do, but actually complete. You know what I mean? We're looking for a sense of completion. And the book of Romans, it really does show us how to find that. And I have so been enjoying this series uh, of Romans, and I think it's so fun to read and to teach through, because even though it's thousands of years old, really, actually thousands of years old, the struggles and the solution are still so relatable. I love that. Why? Because humans don't change. <laughs> we think we do, but we still got the same problems, and so you can go ancient, you know, and still, oh, you, you had that too? Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, so uh, in the letter that Paul, this Romans is actually a letter that Paul wrote, the guy named Paul, wrote it to the church in Rome. And so what, what's happening is Paul is reviewing, he's writing a letter to the church in Rome, and he's reviewing all their wrong turns. Hey, great, you're following Jesus. You signed up for Jesus. Some really cool things are happening in your life. You're finding freedom. Relationships are getting restored, but also you're in the middle of a mess. Uh, and so he's, he's kind of highlighting some wrong turns that they've taken. But his intent wasn't to put the church down. How many of you guys have you ever read, uh, me included, I read the Bible sometimes with the wrong lens. Like I put my judgment glasses on instead of my, oh, this is encouragement. You know, and so when we read the book of Romans and it tells us not to do things, uh, it's not a judgment, it's an encouragement saying, hey, that's a wrong turn. You made a wrong turn. So let's just, let's just go back this way. So his intent wasn't to put the church down. His intent was to bring the people clarity. Paul points out what is not working among the people and turns their eyes to Jesus so we can get back to what will work. Amen? So that's what we're looking at. So in the beginning, I'll just recap because this is the end of the series. So if you want to go back and watch the rest of the series, that's available on Facebook, on the website, YouTube, lots of ways you can access it. You know how to Google. Um, you can find it. Uh, but so I will quickly recap what has happened. And we've had some pretty cool messages uh, and illustrations happening because Elliot does an amazing job at that. But in the beginning, uh, last week, Elliot stood on a table full of cups. And it was you just have to go back and just fast forward until you find that part. It was, it was cool. Okay. But um, in the beginning, what, what happens in the blah, 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 blah. Okay. In the beginning... Uh, Paul points out sin, and he reminds the church why we need a Savior. First of all, because sin is real, so he kind of shows us the bad news. Sin is real, and each person on planet Earth, you and me included, get things wrong. Remember, he's talking to Rome, though. So he says once he points out sin and our failure, great job, he tells the church the good news, that Jesus is the answer to our sin. Okay, And then Paul reminds the church that trying harder, we've all been there, we've tried harder. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. i got to try harder to do better things and to be better. He says, great, now that that's out of your system, that's not going to work either. you got sin, and Jesus is the only way to fix it. And so trying harder isn't. You have to recognize, number one, that, yes, I've got issues. Yes, I've got sin. Jesus, help me with my sin. That's, that's the answer, and, and that's, what he, that's what he points out. Uh, the, he, um, he points us to God and asking for his help is what lends us help to winning the war in our mind. Because remember, he points out that the war is in our mind. There, there, or the battle happens in our mind. The war is out, outside of that. Anyway, then next what happens is Paul corrects the church's thinking again. 
And he reminds the church that the church is the body of Christ. And so each and every person has a place and a function. So the pastor isn't better than the person scrubbing the toilet. We all have a gift. People have more, more of a gift than scrubbing the toilet. But just because you're not on the platform doesn't mean your gift is less valuable. They all have a purpose. And can, quite honestly, if everybody was on the platform, then who would be loving the people? I mean, I mean, come, come on. So that's what he says. He says every, every person has a function, and every person together is the body in the world, and Jesus is dead. So what he's really saying is it's not every man or woman for themselves anymore. It's every man and woman for each other and for Christ. And that's the church that revolutionizes the world because every man and woman. And so he brings all, it's all in the book of Romans. It's so good. We've already reviewed that. So you can go back and find it. But finally, in this last section of the letter to the church in Rome, Paul gives instruction regarding how Jesus' body, us, the church, should relate to this society that we live in and how we should treat each other. You guys ready for this? Okay, let's go. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 13. There are, um, the scriptures are in your sermon notes. You should be able to find that in the little paper you got when you walked in. And they, they'll also be up on the screens. If you have the Version Bible app, it's brown. You can pull that up and follow along there as well. So Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. I want to pray before we open the word, just because it is the living word of, of God. And God has a message to speak to his people of hope and of love and encouragement. So I'm going to pray that we'll be open to receive that. In the name of Jesus, would you open our eyes? Would you open our ears? Would you open our hearts to receive from you this morning? Lord, you've already been ministering in worship. You've already been ministering as soon as we walked onto this campus. Lord, your love has been stirring in our hearts. Would we not shut that out? Would we not shut you out? But would we open our hearts to receive what you would say to us today? Would you bring us to repentance? And would you bring us to a place where we can see clearly who you are and who we are in you? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7 says, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay your taxes. <clears throat> For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor honor. So in this first section, one through seven, Paul is really talking to the church in Rome about their behavior and their attitudes towards the government. Okay. So of course, ancient Rome, the government of ancient Rome and modern day America are not the same. In ancient Rome, this is when Emperor Nero was, was ruling. So if you've heard of Emperor Nero, I think he might have been bipolar. He had some issues. I really was reading, and they were like, if, we, if he had things, he might have been bipolar. I'm like, oh. Ah, anyway, so the government was, was probably, it was crazier then than it is now in our, in our modern day America. But, but Paul makes a point to address, I, I find it interesting that Paul makes a point to address that we have an attitude and a responsibility towards our government. He, 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 brought that into, he brought that up to the church. He knows a lot of times we're just going about our own business and life, and then we decide to follow Jesus, and then all of a sudden you find out, oh, as a representative of Jesus, I have a specific attitude I should have towards the government, so my old one must be squashed, <laughs> and i got to pick up a new one. Okay, uh, the principles laid out by God are unchanging. So the authorities, whether it's the police, the mayor, the governor, the president, they are all there because God has allowed them to be there for good or for bad. And here's the thing. Our responsibilities, Paul writes this to the church, and so it's essential for us to know this. Our responsibility as followers of Christ is not to judge their worthiness. 
and determine based on our own standards whether these people deserve honor and respect. It is our responsibility as Christ followers to show them honor and respect because of the position they hold. Okay, it's our responsibility as Christ followers. Paul's writing to the church, and he says, you don't determine whether or not you want to give them honor. You show them honor because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to point out, I didn't put it in my notes, but Jesus, if you go back and look at the Gospels and Jesus, he never, never, ever, and he could have. He's the son of the living God, and it was the government who helped to crucify him. It was really the Jews who did it. But it was the government that had to carry that out, and he did not spit in their face. He honored their position. He honored Pilate. And he could have spit in his face. He could have said, yeah, well, I'm, you know, he didn't do that. And so we're supposed to take the attitude that Jesus took, and it was we honor the position because God put him there. Amen? Okay, you're not saying amen, but you should say amen. <laughs> Okay, but this means both in our words and our actions. Honor and respect towards any person in authority should be visibly present in a person who belongs to Jesus. Visibly present. What does that look like? Let's break it down. It is honoring and respectful to obey the speed limit. Visibly. I go 85. Okay. That's not the speed limit. It's the flow of traffic. Ah, okay, but, 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 if we're being serious, honoring, respect, honoring and respecting being visibly present looks like obeying the speed limit signs because it was set by the government, and the police officers enforced that. And so to honor and respect a police officer, we go the speed limit so they don't have to do their job and pull us over. Really. Think about it, okay? Um, it's honoring to drive sober. It's honoring to pay your taxes. It's honoring to say thank you to those our, who serve our country in any capacity, any, any form of, of military or uh, fire, any, anything. It is dishonoring, let's show the other side of the coin, it is dishonoring and disrespectful to the governing authority if they need to take corrective action to set you straight. Like being pulled over for going 85 on the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's flat out disrespectful because you knew the law and you chose to disobey it. And if we're disobeying something, we're being dishonoring and disrespectful. I'm not trying to put you down. I'm just highlighting some wrong turns, okay? <laughs> uh, and I make him too. Uh, for example, being pu pulled over by a police officer, or how about this one? None of you in this place have ever had to do this. Being tracked down for the IRS for tax fraud or evasion right? <laughs> it's never happened. But as people who belong to Jesus, our interactions with enforcers of governmental authority should only be good ones. Like, thank you, Officer Jackson, for serving our city. Now, I'm so sorry, Officer Jackson, it'll never happen again. That's, that's what respect looks like. Okay, so the idea of church, people who belong to Jesus, showing honor and respect to governing authorities is just in the government, but it transfers down into any authoritative position. So let's talk about uh, young people honoring and respecting their parents or guardians, students honoring and respecting their teachers and principals, employees honoring and respecting their employers. These are all people in positions of authority, and they have been put there by God. Whether good or bad is not for us to judge. It is our job to show them respect because of the position that they hold. So honoring and respecting a teacher looks like this, listening to the teacher when they are talking. I, someone was telling me the other day, who was it? Uh, yes, they were in, it was college, and they were in class, and there are students who have their laptops with their earphones in watching a movie. And the, the teacher was like, the, the, the story goes, the teacher said, can you at least pretend like you're here? Can you just take the earphones out and pretend like you're actually in class? That's disrespectful. That's dishonoring. And so as a follower of Jesus, if you said you follow Jesus, you're a part of the church, take your earphones out and listen to the teacher who's talking to you. Uh, another thing that looks like Let's think about, just let's go back to the classroom for a second. Anybody have a substitute teacher when you were younger? Or you're in the room today and you still have substitute teachers? You know nobody honors them. They're the substitute. They don't know anything. They're following an outline and they don't even follow it right half the time. Right? Because they just came in for a day. What? Uh, what a Christ follower looks like is we're not going to rally with the other students to make fun of the substitute. We're going to be the one outcast who sits there and actually does what the substitute tells us to do. That makes a difference. That honors the substitute, 
It honors that teacher. And you know what? Even if they never talk to you, it speaks volumes that someone in the room cares for them. Because that's what it speaks. It speaks love and it speaks care when we decide to honor and respect regardless of what the crowd is doing. Amen. So honoring and respecting an employer or a boss looks like doing things the way they have asked without an attitude. (laughs) Uh, Even if you think you have a better way of doing it. Anybody feel like you could do a better job than your boss sometimes? Okay, showing honor and respect. It's funny. It's true. I know. But showing honor and respect means you're going to do it their way even if you think your way is better. I know. (laughs) Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can have a better idea, and you can present it to your boss and your employer, but do it with humility. And then respect their decision if they reject it. Why? Because you need to remember it was your choice to join that team. It was your choice to apply for that job, and you came in under their leadership. So you respect their leadership, or if you cannot, you find another job and you leave properly. Give a two-week notice and do your job well on the way out. Anybody ever given a two-week notice and then just slacked off? (laughs) No, no. Show honor and respect. Finish well. I want to tell a story because I'm not perfect. I had, you know that. Um, Maybe you don't. I had a terrible boss one time. Probably more than one time, but I'm only telling one time. One time I had a terrible boss. Uh, She was, let me tell you about her. She was erratic. She lied. She was lazy, she was disorganized, and she was reactive. She was a terrible boss. I'll tell you that she was probably a decent person had I met her outside of the workplace, but she was not in the right role. She should not have been the boss of that organization, okay? Uh, But I came from a job where I had a great boss. This boss had been organized, he communicated well, he was responsive to feedback, he cared about the people on his team, and it was easy to honor and to respect him. Um, But then I got this new job, and I didn't want to submit to this lady. Like, I did not want to. Uh, Also, it wasn't helpful that I used to go to work at like 3 in the morning. Not my prime time of day. So I was not my prime time, and then I had this erratic, crazy, lying boss who I had to come in and work for. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to keep it together. Because I was a Christian, you know, so I knew I had some responsibility to be a decent human being. Uh, but but I, didn't, I didn't want to. And I remember that I was really mad that I left my old job for this new job. But I left because I needed the benefits. And I was like, okay, here I am. I need the benefits. So I'm going to suck it up, buttercup. I'm going to figure this out. So I didn't trust this lady's judgment. Uh, doing, this is why, because I would do things the way she told me to do them. Like every week she would change how the organization should run. Every week. We had new roles and new responsibilities. I'm like, how are you supposed to keep anything straight if you're changing it all the time? Just keep something consistent for like two weeks. Let's get on track with it. Anyway, she she was erratic. Okay? So higher-ups would come in, and higher-ups would come in to judge our performance and to make sure we were doing our job well. And on a consistent basis, I would get reprimanded for doing my job wrong. But I was doing it the way she told me to. She was my boss. Okay, so I I remember just being super frustrated. Uh, And what I really wanted to do was be sarcastic. I was on occasion sarcastic. But what I began to realize when I, when I was playing the tape out in my mind, and I had to play the tape out to get to this place of reasoning. What I mean play the tape out, I mean consider the action that I want to take and follow it to the end. Where does that action actually take me to? So when we stop and play the tape out, a lot of the times it will correct our behavior before we make the mistake. Okay, so I, I had to play the tape out. But if I were to be rude and sarcastic towards my boss, And if I were to do things my way, my hours probably would have been cut because who wants to schedule a disrespectful employee when they don't have to, okay? So my hours probably would have been cut. I would not have gotten time off if I requested it because she was willy-nilly. She could do whatever she wanted to. She was the boss. So I I wouldn't get time off if I wanted it. Um, I would not get a good recommendation if I left for another job because it wasn't her problem that I had a bad attitude. That was my choice, right? Right? And I would damage or destroy any hope of bringing this person or the people around me to Jesus. 
Because if I'm disrespectful and I have a bad attitude based on her, what does that speak to the people around me? I just have a bad attitude. That's all that looks like. They don't know my reasoning. Uh, so, but I had to play the tape out. Um, as a representative of Jesus in the world, my behavior and my attitude matter. And so do yours. Your behavior and your attitude matter towards your employer. Jesus always takes the high road. Jesus always takes the high road. Let's think about it. Trying to manipulate my boss into changing through sarcasm and defiance would not have worked. Has anybody ever tried that? I'll be defiant and sarcastic and you'll change. <laughs> no, no, you just end up with a super sour relationship and now you work there. That sounds like garbage. Um, okay, anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that went on in that and I, I did have to come, this is, this is the thing. I got really frustrated with that person because I had... When I filled out the application, there was an option on there to, to put your availability, and I had put that I was not available on Sunday mornings. She could schedule me on Sunday afternoon. She consistently scheduled me on Sunday mornings. It's like, I, I even brought that up in my interview, woman. I cannot work on Sunday mornings. I didn't say it like that to her, but I did have to schedule meetings with her. <laughs> that got me fired. Um, Things you think in your brain, right? You think these things, play the tape out. You're not going to say that out loud because it's rude, it's sarcastic, it'll get you fired. But I had to sit down with her and say, hey, look, uh, I really enjoy working for you. Uh, I really enjoy working at this place and the other people I work with. Um, but remember, I don't know if you remember this, but I put on my application that I wasn't available on Sunday mornings. And I've been working on Sunday mornings because you've been scheduling me. And maybe you forgot, but it was brought up in my interview that I, I, I can't work Sunday mornings. And so if you want me to keep working here, can you, can you not schedule me on Sunday mornings anymore? She did it. She did it. But I had to be nice. My whole attitude wanted to be rude and sarcastic and blah, 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 blah. But I was nice and I was humble and I was gentle. And she did what I asked her to do because, in truth, I had said I wasn't available then. But while I was at that job, I had to pray often that I would be nice and do my job well. Literally like every day. And then every five minutes while I was there. <sighs> and then I also played that that lady would be replaced. <sighs> and she was. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. But before she was replaced, she was a governing authority. And it was my role to honor and respect the position, even if I didn't think it was a good fit. To disrespect the governing authority would have been dishonoring to God and it would have damaged my future. So the question is why? Why does Paul tell the church to be subject to the governing authorities? I mean, really. What part does that play in Christian living? What does my Christian life with Jesus have to do with the government or with my boss lady or with my teacher or my principal? Part of the answer is here in the following sentence in, in the verses we read. Paul writes, there is no authority except that which God has established. So here it is. To honor and respect people in places of authority is to honor and respect God and his design. To disrespect authority is to dishonor God. So as the body of Christ, as the church, we are called to honor God. And so because of that, we are called to honor and respect people in places of authority, whether or not we think it's a good fit. And I just, I just, I thought this was funny. So let this one think, sink in. When you make fun of a substitute teacher, when you stare at your parent in the face defiantly, done it, uh, when you tell your boss off, or when you argue with a police officer, what you are really doing is dishonoring God. In the bigger scheme of things, it's dishonoring to the one who created you. It's dishonoring to the one you say you're serving. Um, <laughs> that perspective puts a whole new spin on it, no? <laughs> uh, on the right to exercise my rights or to express myself however I see fit. When I think about the fact that I'm, I'm serving and honoring God, every relationship matters. So Paul is saying, let your desire to honor God be higher than your desire to exercise your rights. Amen? Good. Okay, uh, let's, let's move on to the, to the second part of the verse. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And this one I'm going to break up a little bit. But he says, let no debt remain outstanding 
Accept the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. I just, I want to go back for a second because I broke these verses up, but let's, let's go back and read this section for just a minute together. It says, uh, this is why you also pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. So he's going to go into talking about people, but can I just say for a second, he's talking about your money. He says, let no debt remain outstanding. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then then revenue. And then he goes on to people. But he's talking about the church's finances. And he says there's a wrong turn if we owe people money. I'm going to say this. It's just, let me just, let's just think for a second. It's disrespectful. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you why. Let's say we go, to, um, we go to a couch place where they sell furniture. And we, we buy with our credit card because we don't have the money uh, a $5,000 couch. And then we, we bring it home, and we know we don't have the money to make the monthly bill, but we bought it anyway. And let's say thousands of people do the same thing, and now that business goes out of business because they didn't get their money. Let's just stop and think about that's disrespectful to that person. But that person is so far away from us because it's just plastic and it's business and we're doing things and we're doing things. But Paul is saying to the church is disrespectful and dishonoring. If you owe revenue, then pay revenue. He says, let no debt remain outstanding. Okay, I'll get out of your business right now. Um, But he says, accept the continuing debt to love one another. We'll get into people. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You know this. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, all we're going to go back to just remind you, all people are your neighbor. Your boss is your neighbor. Your teacher is your neighbor. Your parent is your neighbor. Love does no harm. The store owner is a neighbor. Love does no harm to a neighbor. So people in places of authority, including the president and police officers and bosses, are our neighbors. And we're supposed to treat them and love them the way, there's another scripture in Colossians that says, treat people the way that you want to be treated. So how do you want to be, if you were a boss, how would you want to be treated? And then regardless of whether or not they deserve that, you treat your boss that way. Because that's what you would want, and that is love. So Paul is reminding the church that as people who belong to Jesus, we are called to a higher standard than the rest of the world would suggest. Remember Romans 12, 1 and 2. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, which we sang about this morning, oh, your mercy washing through me. Oh, how beautiful. Oh, how beautiful. In view of God's mercy, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Every day we have the call as people who follow Jesus to remember God's mercy washing through me in our lives and to sacrifice our way of doing things for his way of doing things because of his mercy. Romans 13, 11, I did not mean to get teared up right there. We sang that song this morning, and I was like, yes, that's so good, because we're talking about God's mercy this morning and part of this, and we have to remember God's mercy if we're going to live rightly in our Christian life. So Romans 13, 11, he says, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Now, Paul, when Paul was writing this, Jesus had just went back, like not that many years ago. Not that many years ago. And Paul is correcting a wrong turn. He's telling the church then that they'd already fallen asleep. You've already forgotten God's mercy and you've fallen back into your old way of doing things. And he says, wake up, wake up. Remember God's mercy. Lay down your life for his life because salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Jesus is coming soon and we will help be held accountable for every idol 
word. I'm talking about idle words because we say idle words about our bosses, and we say idle words about our parents, and we say idle words about our teachers because we're disconnected from them. And so in our quiet time, in our private life, behind closed doors, we speak idle words. And Jesus says, I'm coming soon. And Paul says, Remember, you're going to be held accountable for things. He's correcting wrong turns. He's saying, no, 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 church. Let's stay on track. Um, Paul is rooting for the church to be beautiful in God's sight. In love, he calls the church to not become lazy and to slip back into old patterns, but to remember that we are working out our salvation. We have given our lives to Jesus, and we are on a mission to look like him to the world. We have to remember that. We are on a mission to look like Jesus to the world. So we have to stay awake. We have to stay awake. Romans, uh, I'll get there in a minute. Romans 13, 12. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. A cross reference for that is Ezekiel 18. And he says, chapters 31 and 32, and God is talking to the nation of Israel. And he says, rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Now remember, Paul is talking to the church in Rome. He's talking to people who are following Jesus. And Paul says to put away the deeds of darkness. He's talking to Christian people. Paul isn't up on some high horse looking down at the church. He's right in the mess following Jesus with them. And he's learning as well to put, the de- put away the deeds of darkness. Remember way back when he says, uh, I don't do the things I ought to do and I do the things. He's right there in the middle. He's not on his high horse whipping people and saying, put away the deeds of darkness. He's saying, put them away. Like, put them away. I found freedom. I put them away. And I'm walking in a, in a new life. So some of the things that we can put away. I thought, Elliot's so good at illustrations. Let's try some. Let us put away the need to be right. Anybody ever beat anybody over their head with their hammer of being right? When I think about being right, I think, get it right. Get it right. That's what it feels like. Being so, put it, I'm going to choose to put down my need to be right. I'm going to put down my hammer. Put, it, put away the deeds of darkness. Uh-huh. Uh, there's another one. Uh, let us put away the need to control. This is a dagger. It's not a butter knife. It's a dagger. Let us can put away our need to manipulate or control through manipulation. I'm talking to ladies in the room because we have an ability to remember all the offenses ever committed against us. And when, it, when it's convenient, we stick the dagger in and we turn it. And we control through manipulation to get what we want. Let us put away our deeds of darkness, our need to control through manipulation. I'm not done yet. There's boys in the room. <laughs> let us put down, well, maybe. This is what I think. You can tell me I'm wrong. Uh, but let us put away our need to control through intimidation. I'll beat it out of you. With my. This is all words, by the way. This is an actual, although I know that happens, I'm not talking about actual physical abuse. I'm talking about your ability to put down your words that intimidate people into doing what it is that you want them to do. Let us put down our deeds of darkness. Here's another one. Let us put down our need to have everybody bow down to your accomplishments. Emma said, Mommy, what are you doing with my crown? I said, can I borrow it to tell a story? (laughs) You know, we put our crown on our accomplishments, and we want people to bow down to us. That's a deed of darkness that we can choose to put away. I can choose to put down my accomplishments. You don't need to know what they are. We're equals in the kingdom of God. My accomplishments don't matter because when I get to heaven, I'm throwing that crown at the feet of Jesus anyway. So why don't I throw it down right now? Whoa! Here's another one. <clears throat> this is uh, <laughs> uh, why don't we put put down the need to slap someone across the face with dishonor and disrespect? Because that's what it feels like. Have, have you ever been slapped in the face? I have when I was a kid. 
that's a little, another story, but you know, when loving parents try to discipline and we just get reactive and so you haul off and whack them in the mouth. <laughs> Uh, it's funny because it's like it's just instinct you know uh, but you get whacked you know we let's put down our need to whack people in the face with our words what that looks like is talking about people behind their back let's just let's just bring it back to the authority place when we talk about the president behind his back because we're never going to meet him anyway but it's a slap in the face anyway jesus can see it doesn't matter if president trump can jesus can so let us put those things down it says, why will you die? Why will you die? Get a new heart and live. And a new spirit. These things are offensive to God. And as I, was, as I was doing them, as I was thinking about them, shoot, they're offensive to myself. When I think about the fact that I stick the dagger of manipulation in, offensive, repulsive. Yet I know that I do it. And here's the thing. I have the choice to put that dagger down. Paul is talking to followers of Jesus here, so he isn't condemning us. He's encouraging us. We can walk out these deeds and these behavior patterns. A few weeks ago, we covered the part of Romans where Paul talks about the battle that takes place in our mind. I already mentioned it. I know the good I ought to do, yet I do the very thing I hate. And the answer wasn't in beating our bodies harder or trying harder to get it right. The answer was in calling out to Jesus, Jesus, I know there's a right thing to do, and I feel like I am getting it wrong. Help me. Help me to get it right. Help me to know your truth. So as followers of Jesus, we can win the war in our mind, but we have to remember that we have made a decision to sign up for new life when we decided to follow Jesus. So here's, here's what I wanna say. Our personal activities need to reflect that decision. I think so often in the church, we sign up for Jesus because it feels good. Emotionally, it feels good. It feels good to be in church because Jesus' spirit is present and he's bringing up things from my past and he's stirring in my heart and these emotions feel good. And so we make an emotional decision forgetting that actual physical activities must follow the decision that we made. And so even though we don't know how to do it, we do them anyway. We're going to read our Bible out for five minutes every day. We're going to turn on worship for five minutes every day. And we're going to pray out loud for five minutes every day. And then we're going to increase that as time goes on. We're going to get better at doing it. It's going to get easier. We're going to understand how to do it. But first, we have to, the first step is just taking the step in the first place. Prayer, this is putting on the armor of light. It says put on the armor of light. That is the armor of light. Read the word. Spend time in worship. Talk to Jesus. A cross-reference for putting on the armor of light is Colossians 3.10. It says, we have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. So leading up to this statement in Colossians, Paul is writing to a different church. He's writing to the one in Coloss, saying much the same thing. I don't know how to say the word. Excuse me. Colossae. <clears throat> He says, you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Living a complete Christian life entails throwing our old things in the garbage and putting on Jesus, who supplies us with new things. So we're going to lay down our rights. We're going to lay down our rights. It's not simply... Christian living is not simply adding a bunch of Christian things and then following a rule book and trying harder to get it all right to remember things. Remember the law kills, but the spirit gives life. So as you learn, as things begin to make sense to you, as you have the faith to believe what you are hearing and seeing, then you implement. As you see, then you begin to do. The decision, we, remember this, as the body of Christ, Paul is telling us, we need to choose actions that line up with the decision we made. And the decision was to follow Jesus because of his mercy. Romans 13, 13 and 14, he says, Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul consistently reminds the church that as followers of Christ, we are consistently at war with our old way of life. So we never want to put the dagger down. We never do. We never want to stop slapping people in the face. It's in our nature. We will always be at war. And so I find his reminders comforting 
and encouraging. Like, oh yeah, right. I'm feeling defeated because I'm in a war and I have slipped back into old patterns. No wonder I feel crummy and I feel like my life is falling apart and my relationships are falling apart. No wonder things are not going well and I feel like I'm cursed. Right. I'm in a war and I've slipped into old patterns. I've gone back into old thinking, but there are tactics that keep my heart and mind protected from defeat. I can either fight or not fight. Not fighting is going back into old patterns. Fighting is laying those things down consistently. Colossians 3.12, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So there are attitudes that we can pick up which will keep our hearts and minds protected from defeat. So if you're feeling defeated in the room, let me ask you some questions. People who are following Jesus, when you find yourself feeling defeated or cursed, ask yourself, am I being compassionate towards others or am I being indifferent and heartless? Your attitude, the attitude you pick up will change the dynamic of your life. Am I being kind or am I being mean? You got to ask yourself the question. Do I have a modest view of myself or am I acting as if I'm better than those around me? Are you feeling cursed? How are you acting? <laughs> it's kind of what he's kind of what he's saying. He's calling us to attention. Do am I being gentle or am I acting like a brute? Am I able to accept delays and suffering and keep my cool? Or do these things cause me to react with anger? Our lives tend to be so fast-paced, but Paul urges us to remember that we chose to follow Jesus and with good reason. He calls us to remember the good reason because of his mercy. And then he calls us to assess our own behaviors, our own thoughts, and our own attitudes to see if they're in line with the decision that we made. We made a decision to follow Jesus. And so Paul says, because you made a decision, now assess your attitude and behavior. Does it line up with the decision you made? This is Christian living. We are accountable for what we choose to do. Paul reminds us that Christian living means we have a responsibility to Jesus, to honor him because of his sacrifice. And he reminds us that honoring looks like loving other people, all people with our behavior, our attitudes, and our thoughts. I'm going to begin to wrap up, but this Christian living is no joke. It really is no joke. And I tell you, I feel the most alive and the most loved and the most full of purpose when I take the time to stop and remember why I chose to follow Jesus. Because I remember his goodness and I remember his mercy. And when I stop and remember his goodness and his mercy right there in that place, then I allow him to show me the places in my life where I'm not showing mercy. And I'm not showing goodness because when I'm in his presence and I see, oh, God, you loved me so much. It's like, he, you know, when you hear a song and it transports you back to junior high. <laughs> when you remember the moment you gave your life to Jesus, it, trans, you know, it transplants you back to that place. And when you're in that place, you have the ability to assess your life and your relationships and say, oh, man, I'm not acting like Jesus there. Oh, man, I'm not acting like you there. You gave me all this mercy. You gave me all this love. What I'm spewing out is, is not that. And then, and then we have the, the, the opportunity in that place. Father, forgive me. Father, forgive me. Let me tell you that I have, um, at that place, he shows me places where I'm experiencing defeat when he wants victory. It, in, that, in that place, I've had to repent for not showing honor. I've had to repent for being disrespectful. I've had to, and I'm talking to other people. Like, it's one thing to just know between Jesus, but it is painful to have to go confess your sin. But he says that in scripture. I've had to repent for not showing honor, for being disrespectful. I've had to repent for being impatient. I've had to repent for being arrogant and prideful. I've had to repent for being heartless. So many things. But I can tell you that every time God has allowed me to recognize my sin, and has allowed me to experience the pain of having to confess and to repent to God and to others, he has brought me closer to his heart. And he has filled me with more of his spirit and more of his wisdom to live better. But it's not by pretending that it doesn't exist. It's by acknowledging it in his presence and then confessing it out loud. And in that place, he makes us better. Amen? And that's, what the, that's Christian living. I'm going to acknowledge and I'm going to confess. I'm not going to pretend. I'm going to bring it from the darkness into the light, and then I'm going to walk in freedom. And I'm going to walk in purpose because I'm living in his mercy. 
This is Christian living, putting on Jesus' clothes that call us to remember his love for us, which challenges us to honor others from government officials and teachers to rowdy toddlers and teenagers with the same love that he has for us. So I have one action step for you because, you know, it's important to have an action step. And it's what I just described, either at the beginning or the end of every day. And here's why I'm saying this. I want you to disconnect at the beginning or the end, whatever time is best for you, when your brain is best ready to receive input, disconnect. And what I mean by disconnect is get in a room where there are no devices. We live in a world of constant input. There's input from the TV. There's input when we're driving on billboards. There's input from the radio. There's input on our phones. There's distraction after distraction after distraction after distraction. And let me tell you, if we're moving consistently from one distraction or input source from another, we don't have time to remember. And if we don't have time to remember God's mercy in our life, then we will not act merciful. We will not show honor. We will not show respect because we're not connected. So I'm telling you to disconnect. Disconnect by turning off sounds, turning off devices. When I I disconnect, I I put my phone on do not disturb and then I leave it in the other room. Because even if it's on do not disturb, I still want to click on it. What did I miss? I still want to click on it. And so disconnect. Turn off everything and then get in another room where there's nothing. And in that place, just go back to remembering when you gave your life to Jesus. In that place, remember his love and his mercy, and then assess your own attitudes. Jesus, am I being nice? Jesus, am I being compassionate? Jesus, am I being patient? Jesus, am I being humble? And if he says no, say, okay. And then say, Father, I repent, because he'll show you. You'll see it. You'll you'll remember that you snapped at your husband. Well, you'll remember that you went off on your boss. And he'll show you that place and you say, Father, I repent. That's not how you treat me. You've never manipulated me. So you repent for that. And then you, the fun thing is now that you know you get to go back to your bus and say, you know what? I was out of line. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. When you do that, when you do that, that's Christian living. That's bringing you out of the darkness and into the light. And you will be amazed how you'll walk from curse into blessing because we're doing it God's way. So I want to just invite everyone to go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. We're going to pray. And I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads just because it's it's a personal moment between you and Jesus. Again, it's, it's disconnecting. It's going quiet. And it's allowing your brain to access a different input, to access his input. So, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Romans. Lord, I thank you that you inspired Paul to write that letter to the church in Rome to correct their thinking. Lord, and we have it forever. Lord, and and as we read it, if we put on the lens that you're not judging us, you're not condemning us, but you're correcting us and you're inviting us not to die. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, and I thank you for the things that you stirred up in your church and in your people. Lord, I thank you that you've corrected attitudes and behaviors and you began to point things out. Lord, and I ask that I pray against the work of the enemy that would just bring condemnation because that's not you. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that there would be conviction that leads to repentance, that leads to life because that is you. Lord, you expose our sin so that you bring us to a place of repentance. And in repentance, we find freedom. And so I ask that for each and every person sitting here today, each and every person listening to the sound of my voice, watching online. In the name of Jesus, I ask for freedom. In the name of Jesus, I ask for repentance. In the name of Jesus, I ask for change behavior that brings blessing because we're bringing our actions into alignment with the decision that we made. And that decision is to follow you because of your mercy. In the name of Jesus, remind your church of your mercy and your love and let us live in that place. Father, not in our pride, not in our arrogance, not in our need to be right, not in our need for people to bow down before us. Father, would we cast down our accomplishments and stand as equals before your throne, holding each other together and building up the body of Christ so that we could be light and we can be loved and we can be freedom to the world around us because that is who you have called us to be. That is the church. That is us in the name of Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to give your life to Jesus today, if you want to make a decision that will change your life forever, I invite you to do that. 
And I also want to invite you, if you've walked away from Jesus, if you have been so disconnected from him that you don't remember his mercy, you don't remember his love, then I invite you back. Come sit at the feet of Jesus this morning. So keep your heads down. On the count of three, if that's you, one or the other, you want to you want to make a decision for the first time ever, or you want to come back to a place of connection, then I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray with you. On the count of three, one, two, three. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand. Come back to Jesus or come to Jesus for the first time and experience real Christian living, true Christian living, where Jesus is present. Amen. And church, would you just go ahead and pray this after me? Father God, I thank you for your mercy that you sent your son for me while I was dead in my sin. And you have made me alive. Fill me with your spirit. I repent of my sin. Teach me to walk out your way. And give me your power so that I can do it your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's celebrate because we had church. <laughs>